Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start on my review of Haunted by Chuck Paulinik, Palaniuk, Palanik. don't know how to say it. I think it's Paulinik. I've been told many times that's how you say it. I just don't know if I believe that. <laughs> anyway, let's get to the blurb on this one. Uh, be oh, Jesus Christ. Before I get started as well, I would like to point out, uh, I got this at the book exchange at my local Tesco. Unfortunately, it's no longer there at the moment because of, uh, you know, the coronavirus epidemic. They've also actually had to stop their free fruit for children, which is a shame because it's, you know, good. It encourages the kids to eat healthily as they're walking around. But this is all by the by, and this face is looking at me, and I can see it in the viewfinder. It's creeping me out. So let's move on to the blurb. Haunted is a novel made up of stories. 23 of the most horrifying, hilarious, mind-blowing, stomach-churning tales you'll ever encounter. They're told by the people who have answered an ad headlined Artist Retreat, Abandon Your Life for Three Months. They are led to believe that here they will leave behind all the distractions of real life that are keeping them from creating the masterpiece that is in them. But here turns out to be a cavernous and ornate old theatre where they are utterly isolated from the outside world, and where heat and power and, most importantly, food, are in increasingly short supply. And the more desperate the circumstances become, the more desperate the stories they tell, and the more devious their machinations to make themselves the hero of the inevitable play, movie, non-fiction blockbuster that will certainly be made from their plight. So yeah, it's kind of meta in a way, uh, because the characters themselves have written the stories about the other characters, and there are some poetry sections uh, that are written in free verse that separate some of the different, uh, you know, different stories, which I really enjoyed as well. And um, yeah, I mean, it's definitely in it you know you can just tell it's his writing so um, I'm gonna go in and look at some of my tabs and then I'll share some overall thoughts and a rating at the end so yeah we start with for example a story about Saint Gut Free and all the characters get their names because of some sort of attribute so we learn how Saint Gut, -Gut Free got his name basically in a freak accident involving a hot tub pulled like half of his guts out of his body but anyway guts a story by Saint Gut Free and um, this first bit is definitely a lie you would die if you attempted to do this I'm just going to read about the, the first page here. Inhale. Take in as much air as you can. This story should last about as long as you can hold your breath, and then just a little bit longer. So listen as fast as you can. A friend of mine, when he was 13 years old, he heard about pegging. This is when a guy gets banged up the butt with a dildo. Stimulate the prostate gland hard enough, and the rumour is you can have explosive hands-free orgasms. At that age, this friend's a little sex maniac. He's always jonesing for a better way to get his rocks off. He goes out to buy a carrot and some petroleum jelly to conduct a little private research. Then he pictures how it's going to look at the supermarket check stand, the lonely carrot and petroleum jelly rolling down the conveyor belt towards the grocery store cashier, all the shoppers waiting in line, watching, everyone seeing the big evening he has planned. So, my friend, he buys milk and eggs and sugar and a carrot, all the ingredients for a carrot cake, and Vaseline, like he's going home to stick a carrot cake up his butt. And then he talked about this as well, which I, I thought was quite interesting. I mean, I've heard this expression and the reason behind it before but it's always good to share people in france have a phrase spirit of the stairway in french esprit d'escalier it means that moment when you find the answer but it's too late say you're at a party and someone insults you you have to say something so under, under pressure with everybody watching you say something lame but the moment you leave the party as you start down the stairway then magic you come up with the perfect thing you should have said the perfect crippling put down that's the spirit of the stairway the trouble is, even the French don't have a phrase for the stupid things you actually do say under pressure. Those stupid, desperate things you actually think or do. Cracking line here. As the French would say, who doesn't like getting their butt sucked? Yes. So here's one of the introductory poems I want to read out. This is Undercover, a poem about Mother Nature. I tried to become a nun, says Mother Nature, because I needed to hide out. She didn't count on the drug test. Mother Nature on stage, her arms are vined with red henna graffiti. From her fingertips to the shoulder straps of her tie-dyed, rainbow-coloured cotton smock. Around her neck, a choker of brass temple bells has turned the skin green, her skin shining with patchouli oil. Who knew, Mother Nature says, and not just your analysis. She says, they test with hair and fingernail samples. She says, that's plus the background check, the morals clause, the background check, the credit check, the dress code. Standing on stage, barefoot, instead of a spotlight, instead of a smile or frown, a movie fragment of night sky washes across her face, a galaxy of stars and moons. Her lips red with beet juice, her eyelids smeared with yellow saffron dust. There, a shining mask of pink nebulas, of planets with rings and craters. Mother Nature says they asked for too many letters of reference, plus a polygraph test, four pieces of picture ID. Four, Mother Nature says, 
holding up the hennaed fingers of one hand, her bracelets of brass wire and dirty silver, rattling wind chimes around her wrist. She says, nobody has four pieces of picture ID. To become a nun, she says, you have to take a sit-down test, worse than the SATs and the LSATs put together, and full of story problems such as how many angels can dance on the head of a pimp. All of this, Mother Nature says, just to find out if you're marrying Christ on the rebound. Her long hair pulled away from her face, braided and falling down her back. Mother Nature says, of course I failed. Not just the drug test. I failed everything. Not just as a nun, but throughout most of her life. She shrugs, her freckled shoulders under the tie-dyed straps. So here I am. The constellation shifting and crawling across her face. Mother Nature says, I still needed some place to hide. I actually thought that poem was better than the story about Mother Nature that followed it. I thought this was another great quote as well. We love war because it's the only way we'll finish our work here. The only way we'll finish our souls here on Earth. So here's the poem about the Duke of Vandals. This is called For Hire. Nobody calls Michelangelo the Vatican's bitch, says the Duke of Vandals, just because he begged Pope Julius for work. The Duke on stage, his scruffy jaw, scrub brush with pale stubble. It goes round and round, kneading and grinding a wad of nicotine gum. His grey sweatshirt and canvas pants are flecked with dried raisins of red, dark red, yellow, blue and green, brown, black and white paint. His hair tumbles behind him, a tangle of brass wire, tarnished dark with oil, and dusted with sticky flakes of dandruff. On stage, instead of a spotlight, a movie fragment, a slideshow of portraits and allegories, still lifes and landscapes. All of this ancient art, it uses his face, his chest, his stocking feet and sandals as a gallery wall. The Duke of Vandals, he says, no one calls Mozart a corporate whore because he worked for the Archbishop of Salzburg, after that then wrote the magic flute, wrote Ina Kleiner Nach music, paid by trickle-down cash from Giuseppe Bredi and his big money silk industry. Nor do we call Leonardo da Vinci a sellout because he slopped paint for gold from Pope Leo X and Lorenzo de Medici. No, says the Duke, we look at the Last Supper and the Mona Lisa and never know who paid the bills to create them. What matters, he says, is what the artist leaves behind, the artwork not how you paid the rent. I mean, I can relate to that as a writer. You know, I write my novels by night and write, well, actually I don't. There's no distinction between when I work on my novels and when I work on my clients. I just work all the time. We get this story about these artists where basically when artists die young, it's because they're part of this circle where they're like killing off artists deliberately to increase the value of their work. Um, goes a lot deeper than that, but obviously you want to read the story for that. What was one of my favorite stories actually but I quite like these little um, nods to Basquiat and uh, Robert Mapplethorpe. Um, I actually read Just Kids by Patti Smith recently, which talked about Robert Mapplethorpe a lot. So I thought it's kind of cool to see this book relate back to that previous book I read, you know. It's after that Terry's career gets complicated. You might say he did his job too well because the art critic sends him off to kill a conceptual artist in Germany, a performance artist in San Francisco, a kinetic sculptor in Barcelona. Everyone thinks Andy Warhol died from gallbladder surgery. You think Jean-Michel Basquiat died of a heroin overdose, that Keith Haring and Robert Mapplethorpe died from AIDS. The truth is you think what people want you to think. I thought this was um, kind of something I kind of related to. Your whole life, she says, you're searching for disaster. You're auditioning disasters, so you'll be well rehearsed when the ultimate disaster finally arrives. But when you die, Mrs. Clark says. So um, we get this story called Exodus, a story by director Denial. This one was interesting actually because it was basically about sex dolls and uh, you know this medical team are using them um, to train on CPR and stuff but then they accidentally get basically sex dolls and um, people start taking them away and they come back full of semen and stuff. But um, we, we start with the original dolls that they have and I thought this was fascinating. Uh, while she knelt next to the dummy and spread her red painted fingernails against its chest, the agency director, Director Sedlak, said how all breather Betty dolls are modelled from the death mask of a single French girl. True story, she told the group of them. This face on the floor, it's the face of a suicide pulled from the water over a century ago. Those same blue lips, the same staring dull eyes. All breather Betty dolls are moulded from the face of this same young woman who threw herself into the Seine River. If the girl died because of love or loneliness, we'll never find out. But police detectives used plaster to cast a mask of her dead face to help find her name. And decades later, a toy maker owned that death mask and used it to cast the face of the first breather, Betty. Despite the risk that somebody in a school or factory or army unit might someday lean down and recognise the long dead body of their sister, mother, daughter, wife, this exact dead girl is kissed by millions of people. For generations, millions of strangers have pressed their mouths over hers, those lips her exact drowned lips. For the rest of history, all over the world, 
People will be trying to save this same dead woman. The woman who just wanted to die. The girl who turned herself into an object. I would say the objectivism of women is actually kind of a pretty common theme in here, but yeah. And this reminds me of my friend here. Uh, if you're into like Myers-Briggs, this is like classic uh, INFP type here. Cora. She was the kind of person. She couldn't buy just one stuffed animal. Part of her job description was to buy a stuffed toy for each kid who came in to give a statement. Each kid taken into custody by the court. Any kid, any kid pulled for neglect and placed in a foster home. At the toy store, Cora would take one little plush monkey out of a bin full of animals. But it would look so alone in her shopping cart. So she'd choose a furry giraffe to keep it company. Then a stuffed elephant. Then a stuffed elephant. A hippo. An owl. At some point, there would be more animals in her shopping cart than in the display bin. And the animals left behind each had an eye missing, an ear frayed, a seam split open, stuffing poked out. These were the animals no one would want. Just thought this this was kind of funny because it breaks the uh, fourth wall here. Um, as he does the last of her brass buttons, Saint Gut Free leans in to kiss Mother Nature, saying, Do you love me? I pretty much have to, she says, if the romantic subplot is going to work. They are all writers, so it does make sense that they would talk like that as well. And then because as well they're talking about what's going to happen once their stories all get out and they're saying there'll be a movie and stuff. And um, so uh, someone says here, little girl, the matchmaker says, he spits a brown stream on the blue carpet and he says, you need to be a little sexier character or no bankable actress is going to want to play you. And so I enjoyed these couple of paragraphs as well. Um, I think they're fairly self-explanatory to be honest. Um, how Comrade Snarky died was probably a heart attack. Mrs. Clark says it's from a shortage of thiamine what we call vitamin B1, or it could have been a shortage of potassium in her bloodstream, causing muscle weakness and, again, a heart attack. That was how Karen Carpenter died in 1983, after years of anorexia nervosa, fainted dead on the floor like this. Mrs. Clark says it was no doubt a heart attack. Nobody really dies of starvation, Mrs. Clark says. They die of pneumonia brought on by malnutrition. They die of kidney failure brought on by low potassium. They die of shock caused by bones broken by osteoporosis. They die of seizures caused by lack of salt. This guy's a chef and he's annoyed about restaurant critics and he says, to my mind, those who can do, those who can't, gripe. And uh, then the survivors, they're uh, eating a meal and here we get, um... Chef Assassin sets the plate on the snack bar's marble countertop and says, who wants thirds? Standing around the lobby here and there, tucked into the shadow of alcoves and niches, in the coat check window and ushers stand, Mrs. Clark and Miss America, Countess Foresight and the Earl of Slander, all of us stand, chewing. Grease shines bright on our chins and the tips of our fingers. Each of us holds a damp paper plate in one hand, chewing. Quick! Quick, before they get cold, Chef Assassin says. These have Cajun spices. It's to hide the flowery smell. It's the smell of Comrade Snarky's perfume or bath powder. Maybe her lace handkerchief. Something sweet with the smell of roses. Chef Assassin says two-thirds of your sense of taste is based on how a food smells. We get here, um, experts say a woman makes only 60 cents for every dollar a man makes doing equal work. I actually thought it was 80%, but either way, it's obviously not a good statistic. And then we here, we, here we have American Vacations, a poem about Agent Tattletale. Again, as I say, I really enjoy these poems. Americans do drugs, says Agent Tattletale, because they don't do leisure very well. Instead, they do Percodans, Vicodins, Oxycontin. Agent Tattletale on stage. One hand holds his video camera as a mask to hide half of his face. The rest of him, off the rack in a brown suit, brown shoes, a mustard yellow vest, his straight brown hair combed back, a yellow bow tie and a white button-down dress shirt. There, the white of his shirt shimmers, patterned with movie actors. Instead of a spotlight, Agent Tattletail is a screen for stock footage, a shot of some theatre audience, rows and rows of people, all of them, their crowds of hands all clapping without a single sound. On stage stands Agent Tattletail, favouring his left leg, leaning a little more to the right all the time. Instead of one eye, that spot filled by the red record light of the video camera, watching. Instead of an ear, on that side of the built-in microphone, to hear nothing but himself. Agent Tattletail, he says, Americans are the world's best at doing their work, and studying and competition. But we suck when it comes to relax. There's no profit, no trophy. Nothing at the Olympic Games goes to the most laid-back athlete. No product endorsements for the world's laziest anything. His camera eye on autofocus, he says, We're great at winning and losing, and nose grindstoning, but not accepting. Not shoulder shrugging and tolerance. Instead, he tells himself, we have marijuana and television, beer and Valium, and health insurance to refill as needed. I thought uh, this was a great start to section 17 here. Some stories, Mr. Whittier would say, you tell them and you use them up. Other stories, they use you up. 
And I think that's possibly true as a reader as well. I thought it was a great quote here. Our humanity isn't measured by how we treat other people, the missing link says. Fingering the layer of, fingering the layer of cat hair on his coat sleeve, he says, our humanity is measured by how we treat animals. Yeah, it's very true, I agree. And then we have a story about like these sort of like volcanic pools almost with boiling hot water that if you're not careful you can accidentally fall into basically. We have this story about a kid who goes in after his dog falls in and it says, the rest of that year they dipped him out with nets, the way you'd clean leaves and dead bugs out of a swimming pool, the way you'd skim the fat off a pot of stew. Because he's sort of dissolved in the heat. We have a reference to Nero my god to thee as well which uh, it's an old hymn, but it's also the song that was being played by the band on the Titanic when it sank. So I've just always been fascinated by that particular song. So it's cool to get a little reference to it. We have a callback to the romantic subplot as well. So we have uh, Saint Gutfrey turns to Mother Nature and says, Now that we're a romantic subplot, how about you give me that foot job? How about it? And then we have this story where um, basically it's discovered that like heaven is on Venus. And people get kind of reincarnated, but ev if everyone dies all at the same time, then we'll be okay, we could all go to heaven. So humanity is like preparing to off itself, basically. And this is a very, uh, I don't know, I thought, well thought out response. Here in the United States, most people went to Walmart or Rite Aid and bought the going away kits. The first generation of kits were barbiturates packaged inside a head-sized plastic bag with a drawstring for around your neck. The next generation of kits were a cherry-flavoured chewable cyanide pill. So many people were emigrating right there in the store aisle, emigrating without paying for their kits. Every couple minutes, an announcement over the public address speakers asked customers to be courteous and not to emigrate while on store property. And so, um, yeah, we have this uh, afterword called the guts effect, which is Paul and Nick talking about the effect that this story had. And as I say, it made a lot of people pass out. I just want to read the start of this essay, really. No one fainted the first time I read the short story Guts. This was on a Tuesday night in the writer's workshop where my friends and I have shared our work since 1991. Each week I would read another of the short stories I planned to include in a novel to be called Haunted. My goal was to create horror around very ordinary things. Carrots, candles, swimming pools, microwave popcorn, bowling balls. No one fainted. In fact, my friends laughed. At moments, the room had the silence of total shocked attention. No one scribbled helpful notes in the margin of their copy. No one reached for their glass of wine. This was better than the Tuesday before, when my story called Exodus sent a friend into the bathroom where she cried behind the locked door for the rest of the evening. Later, her therapist would ask for a copy of that story to help with her psychoanalysis. So yeah, as you can tell, I really enjoyed this one. I thought there was a lot of food for thought. Uh, it was obviously very dark and quite disturbing at times, but that's what I like to read, um, fairly often anyway. And uh, yeah, I thought it was well done the way it handled a lot of these different subjects and really makes you as a reader ask yourself a lot of questions. I also love the kind of the narrative device of having all these characters in the in the writer's retreat all stranded very like and then there were non Agatha Christie style. Um, but then it was cool to see the characters through the stories they told each other uh, through the poems, which I, again, I really enjoyed. And then there's like an overarching narrative as well throughout. So definitely a very interesting book and one that I'd recommend checking out. I mean, if you're new to Paul and Nick, you're probably going to want to read Fight Club first. I actually think Rant is probably my favourite of his novels. This was probably more similar to Rant, I would say, than to Fight Club. Um, but yeah, excellent. Very much enjoyed. I gave it a 4.25 out of 5. So there we have it. That's what I made of Haunted by Chuck Palahniuk. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more. And I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.